Hello, <clears throat> welcome and thank you for joining us today on this Friday in May. Uh, my name is Michael Adams. I'm the Director of Human Resources for the Senate of Virginia. Um, most of you hopefully know that today is the last day of NCSL's Legislative Staff Week, which is an annual time to celebrate and elevate the contributions of legislative staffers um, from coast to coast. Um, it's my understanding that NCSL has collected coming up close to 600 shout outs. Um, all of them are examples of legislative staff's resilience, leadership, innovation, and collaboration. Those shout outs are available on the NCSL website and via social media. And as far as I'm concerned, if we got to 700 before the end of the day, that would be great. Um, I would be remiss if I didn't use this platform to offer my own shout out. Um, First of all, to the um, fantastic colleagues of mine here at the Virginia Senate um, who have, you know, like most of us done amazing things with um, amazingly little in the past year. Um, my colleagues at the Virginia General Assembly as a whole, um, because I feel like we've been in session nonstop since, I don't know, 1876. Um, and then finally to legislative staff around the country, um, you make government happen. And um, as far as I'm concerned, you're true American heroes. So thank you. Um, and I mean that. Uh, today's discussion will focus on the value of public service and public sector leadership, which is um, probably needed now more than ever. Um, we're joined today by Janice Lachance, uh, who is the former director of the US Office of Personnel Management and who currently serves as the Executive Vice President of the American Geophysical Union. Um, and Paul Danchik, who's the Director of Executive Education at the Saul Price School of Public Policy at the University of Southern California. Um, he will be moderating today's discussion. Uh, before I turn it over to Paul, um, just a few tips on using the platform. Um, if you're new to Zoom, uh, we encourage participation during this discussion. So please feel free to type uh, your questions in the question and answer box, um, which is located directly below the video player. Uh, we will get to the questions as best we can if time allows. Um, and also at the bottom of your screen, you'll find a chat box. Um, certainly use that to connect and engage with other attendees. Um, the panelists will um, probably not have the time to engage with you in that format. Um, this webinar is being recorded. Uh, however, the chat box and its contents will not be distributed um, at a later date. So um, speak freely amongst yourselves. Uh, I think that's it. Paul, to you. Thanks, Michael. It's such a treat to be with you and Janice today, two of the biggest rock stars in public service. And I can't wait to dive into um, our conversation today around value within public service from a leadership perspective. Before doing that, just want to give a big shout out to all of you in public service and a big thank you for the work that you do. Um, certainly our societies and communities wouldn't be what they are without your many efforts. And it's often that um, those of us in public service are overlooked and super excited that NCSL uh, goes out each year to be able to recognize the work that you do and for those many shout outs um, that are accumulating. So that's super awesome and a great way to be able to be recognized. Janice, I wanna to toss a first question to you. Um, recognizing you know, where you came from within public service, of looking at it from a federal perspective and nonprofit perspective most recently, what attracted you to public service in the first place? Like a lot of people, I think I was looking for both a sense of purpose and a place where I could make an impact. Uh, when I was in law school, I wanted to change the world. And, and so, how do, you, how do you do that in a realistic way? And so uh, the obvious answer to me was public service and later in my career, the transition to nonprofit. Um, when I was at OPM, it was just staggering to me that I could sign a memo and provide a very significant benefit to 20 million Americans. That doesn't happen every day, and I'm not going to be able to do that for the rest of my career. But having that ability to change people's lives for the better really was what drove me to public service and has kept me in this world of, <clears throat> excuse me, public service and nonprofits. Michael, same question to you. What attracted you to public service? 
Well, I have to be honest and tell you, um, initially I didn't have public service next necessarily in mind. When I was, when I was in grade school, I was a big history buff and um, I went on to, to major in political science as an undergraduate degree. And it wasn't until then that I realized that history and politics, um, the decisions that are made uh, policy-wise um, affect history. And um, it was then that I sort of began to think, well, there are things that I can do professionally that affect history. Um, so my first job out of college was actually with a drafting office. And um, it wasn't until then really that I realized that it wasn't just policy affecting history, it was um, service to the public affecting the societies that we live in. And um, I, I don't think that there's a lot of jobs that you can do where every task um, potentially has a positive or negative impact on everyone that you live with and, and is in your community. So um, it really it wasn't public service necessarily that drew me, but it's definitely what kept me. Awesome, thanks for that. I'd like our conversation to focus around three main areas in this leadership space. Um, the first set of questions are around self. So thinking about how you view leadership and, and practice. Uh, a set of questions around working within politically charged environments. Um, and we'll go with a small P politics here. And the third around um, your HR experiences. Uh, both of you are coming from really strong um, leadership roles within HR systems. I'm gonna get your thoughts on some HR questions coming into play. Janice, how would you describe your leadership philosophy? So that's a really interesting question because I think I have more than one. Um, to me, you have to be an agile leader in this day and age. You have to be able to draw on different styles of leadership, uh, just sometimes even in the same day. But there are some things that really are through lines to all of the approaches I have to leadership. So first of all, you've got to have vision and you've got to be able to articulate vision. You have to show people where you want them to go. Otherwise, it's really not leadership, right? It's just working together and that's nice, but you have to be able to articulate goals in an inspiring way. I think you have to lead by example. You can't ask people to do what you're not willing to do yourself or ask them to stretch in ways that you're not willing to stretch yourself. Uh, finally, I think, uh, not finally, I have one more after this, but wisdom comes from all sources. And so I'm a big believer in collaboration. I'm a big believer in over communication. I'm a big believer in asking everybody who touches an issue, what they think, how they're thinking about it and how they can contribute. And finally, I don't think anybody could get through the last year without realizing how important empathy is to leadership. I'm not sure that we ever gave it enough credit, uh, but we've all had to deal with so much pain and emotionally charged situations that empathy has got to be a big part of leadership going forward. Yeah, uh, I'm really attracted to what you're describing around this leadership space because you know there's classics that we think about within leadership around you know having the vision, leading by example, and what's uh, maybe more modern in the at least literature space is this whole idea around empathy and how empathy ties into the work that we're doing and how critical it is to be a strong leader and have that empathetic stance brought into the mix and something that I don't think we can focus enough on. When we're in the space, you know, Jens, I also am reminding of a conversation we previously had around uh, leadership and you once said that you lead by bumper stickers. What's that all about? Well, uh, sometimes it's just a lot easier to give some to give people something that's easy for them to remember and that they can they can recall um, very easily. And Paul and I met when we both uh, were volunteers for ASPA. Um, I was the president of the American Society for Public Administration. Paul was the president. I think two presidents after me, um, but. One of the things that I think is important is to kind of reduce things to something that's understandable that people can relate to. So my theme for my presidency was the three G's, 
growth, governance, and genius. And that kind of helped people prioritize during the year and help people think about, well, should we tackle this issue or this issue? And it's like, well, this one fits in the three Gs, so let's focus on that. So I think that's just really helpful uh, to folks. It's a, it's a bit of a um, throwaway line to say it's a bumper sticker approach to things, but I do like to reduce things to themes that people can both relate to and remember and use as criteria when they're making decisions. And those are things that still stick with me. Uh, so I imagine you're still leading by bumper stickers now because it really has an impact in the work that we're doing, the way that we frame, you know, how do we stay focused in our work? Yeah. Michael, how do you think about you know, this idea around leading up within organizations? I um, mean, you could think about it, you know, in terms of maybe traditional organizational structures um, as maybe one stream um, and also within a political environment, um, where you're working with those that have maybe different types of accountability towards the organization because they're in an elected capacity. Now, how do you think about leading up? It's, it's, a, it's a huge question and probably deserving of its own webinar. Um, and I, and I'll, I'll even add another layer that I hope um, resonates with everyone who's listening. And, and I think that is that in a legislative staff environment, um, it's, it, if you're if you're nonpartisan staff and you don't play a political role, um, you're still you're you're still having to sort of operate as coworkers with people who are elected to the job. I I I sometimes um, have to remind senators who I work for that they are employees um, and that they get a paycheck and that they are responsible for turning in their open enrollment materials just like everybody else and and they often don't see themselves that way. Um, they, they believe because they're elected officials that they're not employer, employees and that they have a different relationship with the enterprise. And they do, but it's, um, I think it's a healthy reminder to them every now and again to say, you're, you're a coworker. And you know, the harassment policy and the, the sort of expectation about civility and all of those things apply in this workplace just like any other. To, to me, to answer your question, Paul, I, I think leading up or managing upward is really hard in this environment. Um, and and the, the most successful people I've seen who do it, do it um, by walking the walk. And um, like Jenna said, leading by example and not um, just sort of talking about the, the mission, but actually being the mission. And, it, and, and, and I think when people who get elected to, um, to office see staff, uh, not just say their values, but, but exemplify their values. Um, I think it does influence them and it does um, change the way that they interact in positive ways when it, when it happens um, consistently. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Janice, I saw your head nodding a lot. I mean, there's a time in your professional career where you report directly to the president. Uh, from that, in from that experience, what did you learn with an environment about leading up that you still carry forward today? I think what I learned then, and I was very fortunate to work for a president who really wanted to hear people's opinions and wanted to consider them. So to, in my, my experience, it was to find that authentic voice with which to speak truth to power. Um, and, you know, truth to power often implies bad news, right? You know, I'm gonna, I'm gonna tell them that they're really out of line. But there's also truth in terms of just candor, truth in terms of what you've heard from the people they serve, what you've heard from the experts in your agency. And so that's how I look at it. I look at it as very expansive phrase and the ability to be able to articulate that in a way that is diplomatic. I am going to <laughs> concede that, you know, you, you have to do it in a way that's both authentic and diplomatic. But I found 
that in return, I got listened to, um, I got respect, and people were happy to include me in conversations because of what I was able to bring to the table. In some ways that ties into an, another question around you know, different personalities that come into the mix and not necessarily the reporting relationship, Janice, that you're describing. But I suspect there's, were other people in the environment who you simply didn't agree with um, and they didn't agree with you. How do you work with people that have opposing views to what you have or what you're to carry out? You know, I think you have to be really well-grounded and you have to think about your values and what's important to you. And to actually play out some scenarios about how far you're willing to go. You're not always going to align with the person you work for in an elected role or even um, in a role I have now. I, you know, we have a board of directors. I don't always agree with them. Don't tell them that now, okay? So <laughs> don't bring that up. But you know, they make decisions that I wouldn't necessarily um, agree with. So you really have to question almost on an ongoing basis, am I still comfortable here? Is as the scales tipped to a point where I don't think I can work here? And if you're well grounded in your own values, then either you have to find a way to reconcile those values with the decisions that are being made or the, the behavior that's being exhibited, um, or you have to be ready to walk out. And I think that's knowing that point is really that point of inflection, I think is very important. You're bringing in this whole idea around values and you're getting into the space of, am I comfortable here as a way to frame it? It's triggering me to think about a coaching um, exchange that I had with a client that worked within a legislative context um, who had to draft legislation that was against the very being of who they were. It was against a protected class, yet his role was still the nonpartisan space um, and his charge was to draft it. Michael, question for you within a legislative context of what do you do and how do you stay true to yourself when there's competing values that might go against the core of who you are? So that's a, it's a dark place. Um, I, th I think a lot of people, well, I think most people um, probably go through their entire career um, without ever having to face a question about doing what they're asked versus being true to themselves. And um, when people are put in that position where they have to make that choice, um, it can be a really lonely place and, and it can be sort of devastatingly personal, even though it's... Um, just part of the job. So, so I don't want to just cavalierly give you an answer that's, that's kind of, uh, this is how you solve that problem. It's, it's a person to person um, calculus that has to be made. But I, I can also say from a different perspective, um, and, and hopefully this will resonate with many legislative staffers who are listening, um, we work in an environment that is a constant exchange of ideas. And those ideas probably the majority of the ideas don't necessarily agree with our own, with our own opinions. Um, we, we don't leave our opinions at the door, we just don't talk about them. So when we hear things, um, a lot of the times I can say, I don't, I don't, that doesn't make sense to me, I don't agree with that. that, where is that coming from? But it doesn't necessarily um, run contrary to my values. When it does, um, it can be, like I said, a, a very difficult and lonely, um, set of set of decisions for me um the the way that i have managed to work through that when that's happened in my career is i remind myself that that this is the job um the job that i have requires that i hear things that i don't agree with the job that i have sometimes requires me to um put pen to paper uh, to relay ideas that have no basis in my own um, sort of thought sphere. Um, I can think of times when I heard things that elected officials said that were deeply, deeply personally offensive. Um, 
but I could sort of, I don't want to say rise above it. That's not right. I, I could remove myself from the offense by remembering that this is what progress looks like. You know, it used to be a time when rulers told us all what they wanted us to do. And if you didn't like it, then off with your head. Um, we make progress because we come to terms with differing ideas. And, and at the moment, it might seem like there's black and white and never the two shall meet, but over time and throughout history, black and white have met in the middle. And a lot of progress has occurred because someone said something deeply offensive to someone who then turned around and made that a positive action in a direction that was true to their values and, and did make them um, sort of successful from their own core. So, um, you know, I don't wanna make light of the question. It's, it's huge, but it's also um, really kind of stock and standard for the, for the job we do in legislatures. I mean, in response, you're starting to pull out some of the extremes that we face with on a daily basis. And I like to think about them as paradoxes, right? Where they're not necessarily opposites of each other, but they're compelling forces that fight against each other. Janice, is the idea around partisanship and public good, is that a modern paradox? And how do you lead in such environments? You know, I, I don't live it on a day-to-day -day basis anymore like Michael and, and his colleagues do. I, it, there's no doubt the partisanship in the country has gotten worse. The, you know, people have been driven to extremes. But I don't think necessarily that that's an anathema of the public good. I think I agree with Michael that that if people can find their way to at least have a discussion about it or to articulate these views in a way that invites um, or in a way that is open and re hopefully receptive, there can be advancement, there can be public good. Um, there are days when I don't feel that way, right? I mean, there are days when I look at what's going on around us and I think, you know, we're doomed. On the other hand, this is our system. This is our process. We've committed to it. And I think what it takes are very, very talented people like the staffs of state legislatures, like the congressional staffs, to kind of break through that. You know, while the boss is off getting headlines, I know that on Capitol Hill, there are staff members of both parties working together to try to advance a bill, to try to get the both Democratic and Republican sponsors on legislation. So, uh, that's what I choose to focus on. And that's what I hope I'm advancing through my nonprofit is providing solutions. Uh, for example, we care very, very much about climate change. Uh, I work for earth and space scientists. So what we wanna do is help people with solutions. I don't care what party they're from, you know, but if we can advance that, if we can get people to listen to it and at least consider it, I think it, at the end of the day, the public good will will out. Paul, Paul, if I can chime in just with one more sort of thought that I use constantly in orientations here when we bring in new staff and, and we have a big turnover in our um, partisan or personal staff, um, largely because of our proximity to Washington. And we get a lot of people who just hot off of a campaign, you know, want a job in politics and, and they come to Richmond. Um, we talk a lot about, and, and I, I, I hope it's a universal truth that I've visited enough people in enough legislatures to, to believe it is. And if I'm wrong in your state, I apologize, but the vast majority of bills that pass here in Virginia pass unanimously. And, and I think that's true in a lot of states. Um, but, but the press doesn't talk about that. And no one talks about that. And, and I think we should talk about that. Um, we should concentrate as much about the things we agree on as the things we disagree on, because I think that's the path forward. And, and there are tremendous, um, you know, sort of momentum behind a lot of things that regardless of your partisan, um, affiliation you can agree on. And, and I, think, I think 
it's our job to help make that happen. I recognize on how mean those last two questions were. It's just really <laughs> heavy because there's not necessarily one right answer. Like in most leadership spaces, there's not one right answer, but it's these layers of perspectives that come into play. If we look at it from a positive psychology or appreciative inquiry stance, Michael, I think it gets to your point of you know where those commonalities are coming into play. You know, those theories are all grounded with the idea that at a starting point, um, organizations do something well. How have you found what that something is and leverage those strengths within your environments? Michael, to you first. That's that's a hard question from the opposite. Um, I, I will say. I, one of the things I love about working here is we do a lot well. Um, and, you know, and I, and I don't, I don't know that we spend a whole lot of time worrying about why we don't, although we should. Um, the, I, this goes back to a little bit of kind of leading up. I, I, I think that um, if your enterprise, if your office, if your staff is truly walking the walk, um, living the mission statement, exemplifying the values. And if that is um, kind of understood, no one has to ask what the values are because they see them in every person every day, um, then excellence follows. Um, so, so some of that is, you know, just sort of the culture. And um, if that's not your culture, I do think that you can bring influence to bear on it and, um, you know, and, and do some of those things. Uh, exercises that allow you to concentrate on what you agree on that bring people together that collaborate and that create joint product because in doing that you reinforce um that as a as a as a means for getting good things done and more people want to do more of it yeah, yeah same question to you about leveraging strengths yeah i uh I, first of all i you find out what's going well or what's not in my view by talking to people. And that's everything from a structured conversation to hanging around the lunchroom, right? In the, in the middle of the day and, you know, chatting with people. But it's also, I think Michael really hit on it, a culture of continuous improvement, a culture where you're bringing people in, you're hiring this is where HR becomes really important, right? You're hiring the right people for the right jobs and you're hiring people with the organizational values that you want to exemplify. And then you, you find ways to leverage their talents so that you can constantly grow and improve because even though you're doing something well today, circumstances may change and it won't matter tomorrow. Um, this beautiful building I have behind me is the AGU headquarters at DuPont Circle in Washington. Uh, we went through a huge renovation, made it a net zero energy building, um, got in there, spent about a year um, with the staff in the new building and then the pandemic hit. So we had this great work environment. We had all these very flexible rules. People seemed comfortable, um, high satisfaction rates from all our employees because they worked at AGU. And then it, one day it just didn't matter because we had to close. So that ability to recognize that even what's good today may have to change dramatically tomorrow, I think is also a really important part of that. I appreciate how you look backwards and forwards at the same time of being present today. I mean, really shows a lot about your leadership style and approach. You know, I'm hoping that two of you will put on your HR hats on for a second, because there's a modern challenge that um, I've been struggling with personally. Um, and it's really looking at what's happening across our society. And certainly we also feel within legislative environments and there's an increased attention around the prevalence of microaggressions, particularly those who are in the, the black indigenous people of color uh, space, you know, hate crimes, you know, we're seeing against Asian Americans, sexual harassment. And we don't have to look very far to see these examples happen. And I know that they have always historically happened. I feel like we're, uh, experiencing it in a new way right now. 
Um, how has this impacted the way that you lead and think about leadership? Michael, do you want to go ahead? I thought she said you're you're going to make the questions easier, Paul. Um, so so maybe maybe I just heard that. Uh, everything that you said is absolutely true, and and you're right. We don't have to look far to see more examples than than I care to admit. Um, for me, I try to to sort of show up authentically every day with with the mindset that people our are our primary resource. Um, that legislatures are all about people. They're all about relationships. Sure, bills get drafted and that gets put on paper, and the paper goes here and there and everywhere. But but it's the people, it's the conversations, it's the committees, it's the it's the you know task forces and the and the commissions, and they're all about relationships. And um, when I have talked about this to other groups who are not legislative, I I, I sort of put in the you know the doctors on the island. So if 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 you were on a desert island with with ten people, um, what would you want them to be good at? And everyone will say, I want a doctor. And I say, great. So what about ten doctors? And everybody will say, no, God, I don't want that. I want a doctor and someone who knows how to build shelter and someone who knows how to, you know, find good water and someone who knows how to kill, you know, vicious beasts. And, um, and, and that to me is a healthy society, one that is diverse and where everyone's strengths come to bear on a problem differently. And, and workplaces are, you know, the island. Um, and it's easy to say that. And I, and I fear as the old white guy on the panel here that um, I, I'm not doing the question justice, but I, but I also um, believe in my heart that if everyone took a step back and, and re-engaged with the notion that people are the most important resource, um, we would probably appreciate all of the people around us maybe just a wee bit better. And I think that's, that's what's demanded. Yeah, Michael, I, I agree com with you completely. Um, I, there's a couple of other dimensions to this that I'd like to raise. I, first of all, we, we all like to think that this won't happen in our organization or in our neighborhood or whatever. And um, one thing that we've focused on at AGU, or uh, two things is, one is creating a safe space. We want people to be able to speak up if they're concerned, if they're worried, if they're um, experiencing something negative, e even outside the workplace. We don't we don't build these walls. Like don't don't bring your outside problems into AGU. That's not how we think. We want we're looking at the whole person we want them to feel safe. So we make room for these safe conversations that are off the record where people can be candid and really express their feelings. The other thing is we have renewed our commitment to education about some of these issues. What we have found is sometimes people don't realize the impact they have. You know, you'd like to think with all of the publicity and all the discussion about it that people might be a little bit more sensitive, but uh, we just want to keep reminding people of how important this is and how it's a critical core value for the place where they work. So we keep trying to give them tools. For example, yesterday we just, or two days ago, we just had two hours where everybody stopped what they were doing and we had allyship training. And the, the reviews were fantastic, but we know we're gonna have to do it again, right? We're gonna have to set up a reminder session in a few months just to make sure that everybody really is um, thinking about their role in making this a better workplace and a better world. Yeah, I appreciate that. And Michael, you're right. I was saying, we, I wasn't asking mean questions, but part of my role is to ask you mean questions. Oh. You know, both your responses remind me of the work around psychological safety of how do we create organizations that are psychologically safe for people to be able to be in and contribute towards. Um, so very much in alignment with that stream of thought. You know, I 
do want to ask one last question before I'm asking some questions that have been coming in. And that's looking forward from where we are right now. What makes you the most excited about the future of public service? Janice, to you. I think there, there someday we're going to be able to see some silver linings to this pandemic. Um, it's not going to be for a while and we're going to probably have to go through more pain. But I think one of them is a discussion and I'm not saying uh, how it's going to turn out, but I think there's going to be a discussion about the role of government going forward. And, uh, you know, are we going to what role will federalism play? How are we going to define this going forward? And we could say, well, our government has to be able to deal with pandemics. Others are going to say, the you know, the, the Commonwealth of Virginia did just fine. And so let's leave it to them. Let's not have the federal government involved. But I think being in public service at this moment in time, when that kind of discussion is happening is going to be incredibly exciting, even while all of you are working really, really hard to advance the day-to-day -day work of your individual legislatures. I think there's going to be this kind of overarching discussion going on that's going to affect all of us. And it'll really be interesting to see how it plays out. Michael, yeah, I, 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 I agree um, 100%. <laughs> I, I feel like the you know, in, in times of chaos, sometimes the best opportunities arise. And um, I feel like the American public and perhaps even the global public is now more concerned than ever about um, their public institutions um, and the services that they get from those public institutions. And I, I think that, you know, five years ago, most people's regular contact with the government was, you know, renewing their driver's license. And now over the past you know 12 months 14 months they've interacted with their government in much different ways and most of them have been from a position of 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 consumption or need um and i i think that has shifted the mindset of of a lot of of constituents um they now know that government is much bigger than just the people that give them their driver's license and i think they are more attuned to the fact that you know, safe water and safe air and chemical free gutters and, you know, um, good laws and uh, all of those things are um, core to a, to a functioning society. And if we don't have them, we pay a price. And, and so I, I do feel like there's a renewed interest in what government is doing. And I think it's a positive interest. Um, put all the politics and all the divisiveness, divisiveness aside, I do think that I feel like Americans are more engaged with their communities than ever before. And that, that excites me. I think that that is how good change comes about is when people are invested. Mm -hmm. Thanks for that. We have time for uh, one question from the audience. Oh, you heard my fur puppy. <laughs> Was that the question? I'll take yeah. it. <laughs> See what I mean about the pandemic? We've all gotten used to those things now. That's <laughs> awesome. <laughs> so of course we had to get a COVID puppy and uh, he just discovered what birds are. So he goes crazy when there's a bird outside. So I'm gonna ask this question quickly. It's coming from um, Anne from Wisconsin. How do we support our staff um, in our mission on a regular basis? So I, I can go ahead and start. I think the fundamental thing is to, first of all, the fact that you're asking the, the question, thank you and congratulations, you have to make time for it. It takes time to really connect with your staff. It takes time to communicate the mission. So you, you can't just try to fit it in in a, a few minutes at the end of the day or something. So making sure that you have these safe spaces for these conversations, making sure that you're connecting with people individually and collectively, because that's a different dynamic, right? But you're doing it on a regular basis. And as a leader, I think it's part of the job. So make time for it and uh, it's going to have a tremendous impact. 
Yeah, th that's right, Janice. I think it has to be a deliberate, um, scheduled event. Paul, Paul, you kicked us off here asking Janice and I what our what our what our management philosophy is, and and you know, I think that's a question we all have to ask ourselves on a regular basis. And and how has it changed? Because it it should ought to change regularly. And I don't think enough leaders spend time examining what their philosophies are. And, and then when you examine it and you come to terms with it and you define it, um, delivering that and supporting it in your environment, in your um, staff, it is a deliberate actual task on a list that has to be accomplished and it shouldn't just be accomplished once. Um, and it's really hard in these environments where you're working, you know, I, I, I know, drafters that are at it 24 seven, all the way through the months of November, December, and most of January. And, you know, it's hard to talk about your philosophy when you're up to your elbows and alligators, but you have to, because if you don't, if you're not in touch with your philosophy, then you don't have values and your values drive your behavior. So it's a great question, Anne. And, and I hope, you know, giving actual deliberate time to it is, is going to be a successful first step. Mm -hmm. Michael Adams, Janice Lachance, I can't believe how quick the time went. I know. Thank you for your great insights. I took tons of notes from evolving <laughs> philosophies around leadership styles to focus on this idea about being on a mission, bringing truth to power, uh, working and creating this idea of safe spaces. So much rich information. Thanks very much for carving out a part of your time to be um, with all of us and sharing your insights. Michael, I have to do uh, the evil thing now and passing it over to you because I think our time is coming to a close. Michael. And I, I totally agree. The time went by way too fast. Janice and, and Paul, um, I want to thank you. This has been an extremely valuable use of my time. I hope everyone listening feels the same. Um, I, I also feel like we need to remember uh, the National Conference of State Legislatures and their staff for bringing this content to us, uh, for creating Legislative Staff Week, and for reminding us that even though we are um, up to our elbows and alligators, there are people all around the country who do the same thing in the same conditions, and we're here to help each other. So um, thanks to the panel, thanks to NCSL, and thanks to all of you for devoting some time on this Friday. Um, go write your last legislative staff shout out and send it to NCSL to wrap up legislative staff week. Um, and congratulations, job well done. Thank you for being good public servants. Here, here. <laughs>